Welcome to IELTS TV's Israel Daily. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and coming up in today's newscast, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu and his rival Benny Gantz are heading to Washington to meet with U.S. President Donald Trump. But will the American leader finally reveal his peace deal of the century? Coronavirus, that's the deadly Chinese disease killing people around the globe with just a cough. And now three Israelis are quarantined. We have the details. And we'll reveal the incredible discovery a little Israeli boy has made after an outing with his family. We're starting today with a very big question. Could the U.S.'s Middle East peace deal finally be on Israel's doorstep? Well, I know we've asked this question a lot, but this time with Israeli officials heading to D.C., the answer may actually be yes. U.S. President Donald Trump's long-awaited peace deal of the century is expected to be published on Tuesday. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and rival Benny Gantz of the Blue and White Party are already on their way to the White House. The two Israeli leaders have been invited to Washington to discuss the deal. But don't expect to hear any of the details anytime soon. The meetings will be held behind closed doors. Still, Netanyahu and Gantz are both excited for their high-stakes visit. במשך שלוש שנים אני משוחח עם הנשיא טראמפ וצוותו על הצרכים הביטחוניים והלאומיים החיוניים ביותר שלנו שחייבים להיכלל בכל הסדר מדיני. המצאתי אוזן קשבת בבית הלבן לצרכים הללו. ולכן אני מלא תקווה שאנחנו עומדים בפני רגע היסטורי בתולדות מדינתנו. for the different players in the Middle East to finally move forward towards an historic and regional agreement. Now, Gantz and Netanyahu are scheduled to meet with President Trump separately, after which the deal will be released. But not every player is as enthusiastic about it. Palestinian Authority and Hamas officials are all blasting the deal for not properly including the Palestinians in the conversation. In fact, PA President Abbas's spokesperson says that the location to talk should be in Ramallah, and large protests are being called for across the West Bank. That being said, the first half of the deal, which has already been revealed, offers massive financial incentives to the PA, provided they come to any agreement. The Palestinian Authority has downgraded its ties with the White House, however, following Washington's recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Joining us now to discuss the implications of U.S. President Donald Trump's Mideast peace deal being revealed to the public is analyst Gideon Israel, the founder and president of the Jerusalem Washington Center. So I think the first question that everybody has is just, what do we know about this plan? What is going to be revealed that we haven't heard about? Well, I think we can expect that this plan will probably be the parameters that Netanyahu said that he told President Trump, which was the first thing is that um, Israel needs to have secure borders. I think that includes the Jordan Valley, the places that overlook the center of the country. The second thing is that um, Netanyahu does not want any settlers or any uh, citizens, of, citizens of Israel to be uprooted from their homes in Judea mm -hmm. and Samaria. And the third thing is that the Palestinians need to recognize um, Israel as a Jewish state and that it needs to be a demilitarized state. Those are the things that Netanyahu said that he told Trump. And I can't imagine that Trump wouldn't include all those things in the in his peace plan because he has a lot of he, he respects Netanyahu and he has a lot of appreciation for him and he has a good relationship with him. I think Yeah, if I, he also called Gantz, who is Netanyahu's rival, to Washington DC. Why did he do that? Well, I think that Trump wants the plan to succeed. I think, you know, his uh, his Tsevet, his group, worked on it for, you know, two years. Mm -hmm. And I think he wants to give uh, it the best chance possible to succeed. So if that means inviting Gantz, if that means inviting Lieberman, he'd probably also invite Lieberman. So, okay, that's so I think fair. Now, 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 what is the reason that he has decided to reveal this plan this week? Because 
It's been very unclear. He's been holding this off for quite some time. It's right before elections, obviously. But do you think it's a move to perhaps show more of his support for Netanyahu, or does that not matter at this point? Well, I think in the first two elections, he's already shown his support for Netanyahu. I think if you think about if you think about the um, schedule of the United States elections, by June, July, we'll already know who the Democrat nominee is, and then the real campaign for the presidency of the United States will begin. So we're talking about a you know three or four month window to actually work on this so while it could have been last week it could have been in another few weeks um, it had to be at some point soon or else maybe Trump won't be elected and then this will all go down the drain but I do think it had to do with all the talk about Gantz saying you know challenging Netanyahu to annex the Jordan Valley and then Netanyahu was saying okay let's see you let's let's start talking about it this week and then Trump said whoa before you start talking about that what about my peace plan right. that we worked on so, okay, so so what I'd like to ask you about is the Palestinians here, because you mentioned, you know, all of these these uh, incentives for the Israel to essentially want to move forward with this deal. But what about the Palestinians? Are they really going to accept what Netanyahu is proposing? Well, it's not, I mean, what what Trump what Trump and his uh, is proposing, but no, I don't think they will. I don't think they didn't accept what Barack proposed that you know Taiba in two thousand, right. which was ninety seven percent of Judea and Samaria land swaps for the other three percent. And an international force in the Temple Mount. So I don't think they'll accept anything. But I don't think, but I don't think the U.S. really cares so much because in their in their outlook, even if there was no peace process at mm -hmm. all, I don't think the U.S. would be against Israel annexing the places where Jews live anyway. I think for a person like Trump, when he hears, okay, there's going to be a peace plan, or we're going to have a peace process, so for him to hear that, wait, people are going to get kicked out of their houses, that doesn't make sense for a real estate guy from Manhattan. So when he looks at it, he says, why shouldn't the places where Jews live, that should be theirs, especially they claim that this is their the biblical homeland. Right. Well, but in the past, Israel has, you know, moved out of the Gaza Strip as an example. So there, there have been instances in Israeli history where what might seem crazy has taken place, right? Well, well in the past, Trump, uh, Trump supported abortion, but now he's the most pro-life president ever. So, you know, what, nece what necessarily happened in the past, I don't think Trump takes into consideration what previous presidents did. Um, he sees himself as an independent right. thinker bringing independent policy. So my final question, quick answer to this. Will this deal actually work? Will, the, will, will it the be The deal as, as, as yeah. both sides accepting it? Mm -hmm. Certainly not. All right. But I think it'll help the Israelis. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. Well, we have all been waiting for an update from Russia's President Vladimir Putin about the release of the Israeli-American backpacker Nama Isakal. The 27-year-old is sitting in a Russian jail on drug smuggling charges. And Putin even met with her mother last week here in Israel. Well, joining us with the update is ILTV's Shanna Fold. Shanna? Now, Naama Issachar has become a household name here in Israel. You can see signs that say, bring Naama home on buses, on the, on the uh, electric display at Kikar Rabin. And she finally actually penned a pardon to the president of Russia, saying that she would like to be excused from this crime. And Israelis are wondering what's going to happen next. The old adage, no news is good news, is not exactly comforting the Israeli public this week. Israeli-American backpacker Naama Issachar is still in jail, despite the fact that Russian President Vladimir Putin met with her mother last week in the Holy Land. Putin flew in for the World Holocaust Forum and even spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu about Naama's potential release. The 27-year-old was detained nine months ago during a stopover in the Moscow airport after authorities claimed they found a handful of marijuana in her checked luggage. She was tried and sentenced to 7.5 years behind bars for drug smuggling, a sentence many say does not fit the crime. Well, during that Jerusalem meeting, Putin told Naama's mother that everything would be okay and that he would return her home. Well, Naama has only now filed a presidential pardon, which means we have to wait and see what happens. Russia's human rights commissioner visited young Naama in prison days ago and told her she was glad the saga was about to end. However, it still remains unclear when or if the backpacker will be released anytime soon. Well, there's something else that has everybody on edge, and that is a new virus that looks like it has made its way over to Israel. Over 2,000 people have been affected with the coronavirus worldwide, and 56 are already dead. Fever, headaches, sore throats. 
These symptoms usually point to the flu, but they could be signs of coronavirus, a deadly disease that's believed to have originated late last year in a seafood market in the central Chinese city of Wuhan, and is most likely transmitted through coughing and sneezing. Over 2,000 have been infected, and 56 are already dead. The World Health Organization has stopped short of calling the outbreak a global health emergency. But health experts are concerned as to whether China can continue to contain the epidemic. Wuhan is home to 11 million people, and now it's on virtual lockdown with transportation all but severed into the city except for emergency vehicles. Still, cases of the disease have already been detected in other countries, including the United States, France, Japan, and Canada. Male who's in his 50s, um, he had traveled to Wuhan, China, and uh, come back and within, uh, within a day became quite ill. And um, the emergency service uh, was aware of his travel history, used full precautions, uh, was taken to Sunnybrook Hospital and is now um, in a negative pressure room. Here in Israel, three Israelis are currently hospitalized in isolation in Jerusalem, amid fears that they may have come into contact with the deadly virus while traveling in China. But they've apparently been cleared of the diagnosis after lab tests. Now the Israeli health ministry has issued a warning for Israelis not to travel to China and the region unless it's absolutely critical. The Israeli airline El Al is reportedly allowing travelers with tickets to China to change their flight without any fees or penalties. Now, wildfires across Australia have killed dozens of people and billions of animals, and we've been seeing as they destroy massive amounts of land along the way. Now, putting these fires out is a very, very dangerous job. And now an Israeli defense firm is coming to the rescue with a new and less risky method to put out the flames. So how do you put out a massive wildfire? It's risky business, but it's a business that the Israeli security firm Elbit now says they have a solution for. Imagine being able to drop massive amounts of flame retardant on wildfires from high, high above. Well, that's exactly what the system Hydrop does. Using it, firefighting aircraft can extinguish burning fields from a minimum altitude of 500 meters. That's four times higher than the current average altitude for today's firefighting systems. Currently, firefighting aircraft have to fly low and during the day only because they make their way through smoke, ash, and hidden terrain, posing extreme risk to the crew. You see, the fire retardant liquid that they're dropping isn't effective from higher up. But Hydrop, on the other hand, uses flame retardant and biodegradable pellets that can be dropped from 500 to 2,000 meters above. And it even has a 95% success rate for hitting its target day or night, thanks to its auto-sensory capabilities. But best of all, the Israeli system can be outfitted to almost any aircraft in just a few minutes, which significantly reduces response times. Almost all Israelis are drafted into the Israeli army when they turn 18, and many of them are forced to witness things that most people their age around the world rarely see. Now, going back to civilian life after the army isn't always so simple, which is why one NGO called Bishvila Machar has made it their mission to help Israeli veterans move forward and combat PTSD. Well, joining us now is Eyal Buchler, an instructor and volunteer, and Eden Joseph, who served as a casualty officer in the IDF and has taken part in this program. So, Eden, I'd actually like to start with you. Tell us a little bit about what you did in the Army. Where did you serve? Okay, so I've been a casualty officer. That means I uh, escorted brave families and uh, wounded soldiers and actually helped them to go through the hard times. Wow, so that means that you were dealing with families who had either experienced loss, they'd lost a son or daughter yes, in the army or had been affected in, in some other way. Yeah. So how did that experience impact your life after you got out of the army? Um, so I felt, uh, in the beginning I thought I left everything behind me, but uh, after a few months I finished my service, I realized that I become a different person, a bit of a pathetic person, uh, no feelings, no crying, no uh, mm -hmm. excitement. 
and uh, that makes me feel that I, I actually maybe need help. Right. So yeah. that's, of course, where you come in. Tell us a little bit about Bishvila Machal and, and what you guys do, what kind of programs you have. Great. So uh, Bishvila Machal exists for about 12 years now. We served about uh, almost 1,500 soldiers, veterans, who came through the program. Um, our program is basically is a short-term program where we uh, meet uh, these veterans. We take them on a journey where we start in Israel for a couple of, a couple of days, mm -hmm. and then we go abroad for about eight days. Majority of our uh, uh, journeys are abroad. And then after we come back, we do, again, a two days uh, uh, journey here in Israel. So you're basically putting together groups of veterans who might have experienced similar things, and you're taking them on a trip abroad to kind of reflect on their right. army experience. But I'm, I'm assuming the volunteers and instructors have experience dealing with emotional stress or... Right. Right, so, so uh, we all come from, uh, all, the volunteer, all of us are volunteers, and we all come from, from uh, professions that deal with uh, stress, with uh, PTSD, and so forth. But not everybody has PTSD on these No, the groups. majority don't. Uh, they, they don't have it. Uh, they don't have the full scale, but they do show some of the symptoms, and mm -hmm. these symptoms that do uh, uh, affect our life. Of course. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's affect the way we, we treat other people, the way we interact with other people, the way we go to study, uh, uh, and uh, through this process, uh, basically, uh, we work a lot with uh, these guys on resilience, right? Uh, and bring in, bring them back to a position where they can be uh, live fully. And also, I mean, I think just the the taboo around speaking about what you've gone through in the army is a very big barrier that a lot of people here have. For you, who took part in one of these programs. What did it do for you? How did it affect you? Uh, it's actually given me a place to, to talk without a judgment because uh, when I was in the army, so I felt people don't want to hear because of the taboo. Like it's not... Uh, right. You're not supposed to, to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, about uh, death or uh, injured. So, so it was the first time I can talk and really, really, people can really listen to me right. uh, and want to listen to me. So uh, it makes me feel good. And it, uh, the program gives me a lot of uh, tools how to deal with my difficulties uh, in the right way. Right. Um, yeah. And also it creates a community, I imagine, which is a huge thing. Just exactly. knowing that there are other people like you who are dealing with these issues. Well, Bishvila Machal, I know that you guys are always looking for donations to be able to kind of support these journeys or trips that take place multiple times a year. So for our viewers out there who want to support this incredible organization, please look up Bishvila Machal online, go to their website and donate. Thanks so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we're moving on to a completely different story. Now, only 1% of people will develop a malignant brain tumor in their lives, but of those who do, 95% of them will succumb to the illness. Now, in an effort to turn those numbers around, Israeli really researchers have come up with a way to use electric pulses to take down tumors. Check this out. It's called glioblastoma, or GBM. And if you know anything about it, you know that this aggressive form of brain cancer kills 95% of its victims. And until now, treatment has been sparse. Israeli researchers have now come out with a device that zaps tumors using electric pulses. And the innovative treatment is now going to be streamlined into Israel's socialized healthcare system. It's called the Optune, a netted cap using TT fields or tumor treating fields, which are alternating electric fields to specifically target cancer cells without causing too much harm to nearby healthy ones. The device is meant for patients who have been recently diagnosed with GBM or are going through chemotherapy. The Optune was developed by an Israeli biotech firm called Novocure. One patient suffering from the disease tried the cap mid-chemotherapy. He says while the cancer doesn't seem to improve, the treatment has prevented his condition from getting any worse. Novocure has gotten FDA approval and is approved in Europe, Canada, and the United States. That's just unbelievable, but this story is too. This is one of those only in Israel stories that you hear about. A 13-year-old Israeli boy was foraging for mushrooms following the recent rainfall when he stumbled upon something unbelievable, a stone slab with a Greek inscription that's believed to be thousands of years old. <laughs> Stav Meir is just in seventh grade, and he was out hunting for a wild mushroom with his family in Caesarea when he noticed something strange. 
a stone slab sticking out of the ground that was most likely brought to the surface by the downpour. Meir says he immediately recognized it was something ancient because he studies archaeology in school with the Israeli Antiquities Authority. אני שמח שבעקבות הלימודים האלה הוא בעצם uh, קיבל את הכישורים לבוא ולהגיד מצאתי משהו, יש לזה, בא, יש לזה ערך, זה בעל ערך. Well, the 13-year-old was certainly right about the value of his discovery. The IAA has identified this lab as a Byzantine burial inscription engraved in Greek with a cross. The identity of the deceased reads the grave of Anastasius or Anastasia, according to researchers. They say that in ancient times, Caesarea was a center of attraction for a wealthy population, and that the quality of the slab discovered indicates that the person entombed probably had a lot of money. Well, little Stav Meir has now been awarded a certificate of appreciation from the Israel Antiquity Authority, and he'll give a special lesson to his class for the discovery that he made. I wish I could make a discovery like that, Kaden. All right, it is time to learn about some must-see places to visit here in the Holy Land that even some Israelis don't know about. They're brought to you by Visit to Israel, one of the world's leading Instagram pages about how to travel in Israel. So without any further ado, here is Uri Mol, the owner and tour guide with the Let's Tour Israel travel agency. So, Hello. Uri, what is up first? I'm excited. Well, we're going to drive down to the desert, towards the Dead Sea. But okay. before we get to the Dead Sea, you take a right and you just drive into the desert Nothing, nothing, desert, desert. Then in the distance you see Nebi Musa. Nebi Musa. Nebi Musa is a mosque, which oh, is 700 wow. years old. It's, it's kind of fortified to keep from intruders from coming in. Right. I mean, it's in the middle of the desert. Exactly. So that's a pretty good fortification, if but you ask why me. But why build a mosque in the middle of nowhere? It's, that's a good question. In Islam, it's believed that this is where um, Moses is buried. Really? The Moses, yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, I'm assuming the tourists who come there come from every different kind of background, right? They do. Just because Moses is a very known character in right. any religion. He's right. an important prophet in Islam. He's an important character in Judaism and Christianity. But Judaism, if you read the Bible, he was never allowed into Israel. He stayed in Jordan right. while the Israelites cross in. And he's stuck there and he dies alone in Jordan. Islam is more forgiving, and in the Islamic version, he's allowed in, at the end of these days, to, to come into Israel. God forgives him. He comes in, and he's buried in the desert of the land he spent most of his life bringing the Israelites to. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. All right. So what is up next? Because we're running up low on time. Up the guest is Tel Megiddo, also known as Armageddon, when, where the end of the world should take place. But it's an actual spot. It's a hill overlooking the Israel Valley mm -hmm. with a good vantage point, which means it's been conquered and occupied by many different cultures. And if you go there, you can see 20 different cultures who lived in the same spot, also a beautiful viewpoint of the valley. And the highlight, if you're willing to walk a lot, you walk down into an aqueduct and you follow an underground tunnel that leads to a spring, Interesting. which the locals, they dug out so they can get water without their enemies besieging them knowing that they can get Is there water. still water there? Yeah, of course. Wow, yeah, so you I... can even dip your fingers in. Well, no, you can hear them flowing, but you can't actually... Okay, all no... right, that's fair, that's fine. All right, well, thank you so much You're for welcome. joining us. Two more locations that I've got to visit. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, now this is hilarious. The Israeli army and the Israeli prime minister are joining the internet by posting their own version of the LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Tinder meme. Now, for those of you who have not seen it yet, it's a four-picture image that shows how people represent themselves differently on each social media platform. Country singer Dolly Parton is the one who actually started the whole trend. And LinkedIn photos are supposed to be more formal. Facebook is family-friendly. Instagram is more glammed up. And Tinder is a bit more sexy, you could say. But the idea certainly had some fun with it. Their Tinder photo features a Navy SEAL getting ready to propose. Not bad at all. Now, Netanyahu, on the other hand, made his own version of the meme, including Twitter, and he's posing with Trump in that photo. How fitting. I guess neither need to use dating apps. All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight, we'll see some clear skies with a low of 7 degrees Celsius or about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Tomorrow, expect a high of 19 degrees Celsius or 66 degrees Fahrenheit. And there will be sun, but clouds are rolling in during the afternoon, so don't forget to bring a jacket for those moments in the shade. And now, before we go, let's take a look at what is going viral in Israel on tubing. Okay, 
That is what happens when you get to go home from base because of the rain. There you go, guys. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.45 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube. I'm Natasha Kierchuk, and thanks for watching.